right. <laughs> I don't know about you guys. That song, it felt like a walk-up song a little bit. Like that hyped me up a little bit. That was fun. I need you to know there's a shot of some guys like slow-mo walking down the hallway in that video. Everybody saw that? They planned that for like 15 minutes. <laughs> like it, they were like, they were like, it's one button, two buttons, one button. Like it took, it was a long, it was a lot to watch. Um, guys, like Brandon said, my name is Taylor. I'm the student pastor here. I'm, I'm so excited to be up here to be closing out our I Am series. Um, I just wanna say before we start, uh, just a thank you. Um, I've been here, my wife and I have been here for about six months and it f- kind of feels like we've been here for years. Um, just the way that you guys have welcomed us so well, loved us, prayed for us, uh, has meant the world uh, to me and to her. So I just wanted to say thank you for welcoming us. Well, students, if you're in here, thank you for welcoming us into your crazy that you navigate. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. And how, I mean, how can I not have fun when we get to go away and do weekends like that? It's been the best. Uh, Getaway weekend was genuinely phenomenal. Um, our theme for this uh, weekend was in Christ. And so we spent the whole weekend talking about what does it mean uh, to be in Christ? What does it mean that when God calls us ch- his children, that that's the truest thing about our identity? Um, and it had some phenomenal conversations with students, both at the retreat and kind of on the back end of the retreat. And after we spent so long talking about identity, um, had a lot of questions that come up that were really good, uh, but that were kind of tough. And those, those questions kind of went something like this. It was like, Taylor, I, I believe in Jesus. I know that I've trusted in him for my salvation, uh, but there are days where I don't feel close to him. There are days where I really wanna feel connected to God, but I just don't. How do I feel more connected to God? Or even a question like, Taylor, I know, I know I've trusted in Jesus, I am saved, but I've got these sin struggles that I'm really struggling to let go of. And I'm, I'm fighting and I'm working, but I just can't seem to overcome these. How do, I, how do I grow out of them? How do I bear fruit? How do I obey Jesus the way that I want to and know that I'm supposed to? They were great questions. Um, and as you guys know, those aren't just questions that teenagers ask. Those are, I've asked those questions. Um, I know some of you have asked those questions. How do I bear the fruit of the Christian life? How do I feel and stay connected to Jesus? Even the apostle Paul who wrote half the New Testament struggled with this tension. In Romans 7, verse 18 and 19, he says, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I don't want is what I keep on doing. Paul is framing this and he's saying this is kind of the normative experience for somebody who is in Christ, that we know that we are saved, we know that we're good, but we still struggle against our flesh and we still struggle to know how to stay connected to Jesus and how to, how to bear the fruit of the Christian life. And thankfully, Jesus meets us in this tension. So in the last I am phrase of this series uh, is where we're gonna be, which is in John 15, verse one. If you guys wanna go ahead and turn there with me. John 15, it puts us right in the middle of the upper room discourse, uh, which is where the Last Supper takes place. It's where Jesus says that Judas is gonna be the one to betray him. That's happened actually right before the text we're gonna be in this morning. And John 14 through John 17 is really Jesus's last moments to kind of share with the disciples everything they're gonna need to know before he goes to the cross. This is their last big moment to kind of have a conversation to themselves. So there's a lot in this passage um, and it's right here that Jesus drops the last I am statement. So let's start in verse one. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So in this passage, Jesus, he gives us the how, right? The how do we bear fruit? And he also gives us the why. So that's where we're gonna be today. But in this first passage, we get the how. And how we bear fruit is that Jesus is the one who enables us to bear the fruit of the Christian life. 
Jesus is the one through a relationship with him that we are able to bear fruit. In verse one here, we see that Jesus says, I am the true vine. And this is interesting because throughout this whole series, right, this is week seven of the I am statement. So we know that every time Jesus says, I am, he's connecting himself with Yahweh. He's connecting himself with the God of the Old Testament, the God that we follow, um, the God of the Jews. And that was a big statement for him to do. Anytime he says, I am, people got upset because it's a big deal that he is connecting himself literally and personally to God the Father. It's a massive deal. It's no different in this text, except one little thing. Jesus here says, I am, and then he goes on, the true vine. He doesn't say, I am the vine first. He says, I'm the true vine. And this is interesting because it's almost like he's implying that there's a different vine. That when he says that to the disciples, they might have another vine in mind that he could be alluding to and saying that he is greater than. And this is true. If we look all throughout the Old Testament, Israel is frequently referred to as God's vine or as God's vineyard. So there was theoretically another way. Israel was supposed to be the ones who showed God's kingdom to the world. They were supposed to be the ones who bore fruit and who pointed people to the Father through their fruit and through their actions and through their lives, but they failed. We know the story of Israel. The whole, their whole history is full of them failing to bear fruit, them being judged for not bearing fruit, God calling them back, redeeming them, forgiving them, and then getting it for like a day. And then, and then forgetting again, and then failing to bear fruit. That's Israel's whole history. So when Jesus says, I am the true vine, he's saying, I'm the final vine. I'm the genuine, real vine vine that Israel was always supposed to point to. I'm the fulfillment of all of God's promises that were to come through Israel. This is why the Pharisees were so upset. Not only was Jesus connecting himself to God, the father, but he was connecting himself to the law, to their whole history as a nation, which would be, that would be a wild thing to do unless you were the son of God. So go figure, because that's exactly what he did. Jesus came to show Israel and the Gentiles, which is all of us, how to bear true fruit because he's the true vine. And now I think it's important here before we go on, we have this phrase, bear fruit. And in the Christian circles, in the church, we can use this phrase a lot. And we say, we all wanna bear fruit. And we all kind of assume that we're all talking about the same thing (laughs) without really defining it. And so I think for our purposes this morning, it's important that we define it. It's important that we know exactly what we mean when we say that we're, we want to bear fruit. And I think simply bearing fruit is living like Jesus and loving like Jesus. It's living like him and it's loving like him. There are other examples in scripture. We can look to the fruit of the spirit. We can look to all of Jesus's words, but simply living like Jesus and loving like Jesus. And we know the life that Jesus lived, right? Jesus lived a perfectly holy life. Jesus never had a selfish thought. He never did anything uh, to, like, as out of a power grab, seeking power for himself. He never looked down upon anyone. He loved people well. And he lived a life that pointed people towards the kingdom of God. And so when we as believers say we wanna bear fruit, that's what we mean. We wanna live a life that points people to God's kingdom. We want to live a life that looks like Jesus's life. And we want to love people the way that Jesus loved people. That's our goal. That's what we want. But if you've been around for five minutes on this earth, we know that, right, that's not easy. (laughs) The fact that Jesus was perfect is a big deal for a reason. And that's because as much as we want to live a perfect life, as much as we want to love people well and live well, we can't. We can't perfectly do that in the way that Jesus did. We can't live the life we wanna live and love people the way we want to. Which is why Jesus didn't just come as our moral example. He didn't just say, hey, follow me. Here's the right way to live. He said, no, I'm gonna live the life you need to on your behalf. And then I'm gonna die the death that you deserve. And then I'm gonna raise again, defeating death for you. I came to do exactly what you needed to do to be made right with God. And he did it for all of us. 
Jesus didn't just come for, to be our moral example. He came to be our substitute. And because of that, on this side of the cross, we are only able to bear true fruit when we're connected to the true vine. Let's look at verse four here again. Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus uses this picture of the vine and of the branches, uh, which I really appreciate when he does. I'm a visual guy, so I, like, I really need kind of the image there to help me get the full picture. Um, and because of that, I've got a picture for us up here on the screen. If you would look with me, this is a vine um, from a vineyard. As you can see, the vine is that big, thick one on the left that all of the branches are coming off of. And off the branches, they, those branches are growing what well, looks like really healthy, really good fruit. That's a thriving, healthy plant right there, connected in all the ways that it should be. However, if those branches were ever to be broken off, if they were ever to fall off, then immediately that fruit that's growing on them would cease growing and it would start to decay. Immediately. There's no, it wouldn't take long. It just, as soon as they would be disconnected, that's what happens. In the same way, we only can bear fruit. We can only grow fruit when we are connected to the vine, to the true vine. And Jesus tells us in this passage, the way to do that, the way to be connected to him is to abide in him. And again, let's define our terms here. Because abide, we see it's an important word. It's used in this passage from verse four to verse 10. I think it's used like 10 times. So it's important. We need to know exactly what it means. And a really, a really easy, simple, good definition of this word abide is to remain. To abide means to remain in Jesus, to remain with Jesus. As I was studying this week, another author I saw, he actually, he described it as to abide in Jesus means to find our home with Jesus. That we would look to our relationship with Jesus, it would be home for us. When we would look to it, it would have kind of sort with it this essence of permanence, that it is always there. It is always our resting place. And Jesus, as we are forever in him, as he holds on to us when we're saved, this process of abiding, this process of the Christian life is learning what it looks like to hold back onto him. He is constantly holding us and we're figuring out how to hold back. And this metaphor of the vine, again, illustrates the point. If, these, if this fruit just had kind of constant or like little nutrient drips over the course of time every now and again, it wouldn't bear fruit. It needs that constant connection, needs to be connected always, permanently. We need constant connection to Jesus to love like him and to live like him. But what does connection to Jesus look like? What does abiding with Jesus look like for us on, on this side of the cross? Because for the disciples, I would imagine if you were to ask them that question, they'd go, well, like we had lunch with Jesus today. And like, I think we're gonna walk to the beach. And so like, we'll walk together. And then we'll get on the boat, so we'll be with him. Like they, they were just with him. They just abided with him all the time because that's what they did. For us, post-cross on this side, it's not that easy. But I also don't know if it's as difficult as we make it. Connecting with Jesus really and truly just looks like how you would connect with a best friend. It looks like how you would connect with a friend. If you have somebody that you like and you're starting to get to know them, you're gonna wanna spend time with them. You're going to want to get to know them, to learn about their history, where they came from, how they grew up, what, where's their heart at, what's their heart like? What are they feeling about their life? Like you're gonna wanna engage with people in this way. You're gonna talk a lot. You're gonna listen to what they have to say. And the more that you do that over time, the better your relationship is gonna be, the closer you're gonna feel to one another. Our relationship with Jesus is the exact same way. I mean, connecting like a friend and connecting with Jesus look like talking to them. It looks like listening to what they have to say, both in the word, through prayer. It looks like devoting time to be with them. And there are some really practical ways for us to do this. Um, I think reading the Bible every day, reading God's word to us every day, is a huge step towards that, towards that abiding in Jesus. Here's my shameless dwell plug for the morning. 
Um, we have been doing this for the past couple of months. We are starting a new today, actually. So if you need a new dwell bookmark, go ahead and pick one up downstairs. But personally, guys, this has been really good for me. It's been good to, as I've come into the office and have read, uh, to be able to, one, not only have that on my heart as I'm going throughout the day, but to be able to talk about it with those that are around me. Um, we, as a student ministry, we're reading through Dwell every day. So it's been awesome to text students and be like, hey guys, what, tell me what you got today. Um, especially on days where either I forgot to read or where I read a passage and it just didn't hit me like I wanted it to, right? I think we all have those days where we read the Bible and it's like, I don't really feel anything. I didn't really get anything. One, that's okay. But two, that's why community is so important because we need each other. We need to feed off each other and learn from one another about the truths of God's word and about the truths of who Jesus is. Some other ways you can engage in this, you can pray to yourself. You can pray out loud. Um, you can listen to music that reminds you of God and points you to him. You can even go out in nature and take a walk and look at the creation that God has given us and thank him for that and glorify him in that. And the reason that we do all these things is not an end of themselves. Like they're all good things for sure, but we're doing them to set habits and rhythms in our lives to remind us to look to Jesus. Because left to our own devices, we forget. Our days get busy. There are days where I go to bed and I'm like, oh man, I, I'm not gonna pray today. I haven't prayed today. Because life gets busy. But if we cultivate habits of abiding in Jesus, ways that, practical ways that we can lean into, our hearts are gonna be set towards him. And our hearts are gonna grow. We're gonna learn to live like him and love like him by abiding with him and by spending time with him. Also, for all those examples I just read, uh, students gave me all those last Sunday. We did a little exercise. They helped me with that sermon. So students, if you're in the room, thank you for that. Um, I love to pawn application off on you. So I appreciate you helping me. <laughs> um, that is the how we abide. We create rhythms and habits that help us to look to Jesus every day. That's what we need. And the how, us knowing the how feels good, right? It kind of scratches that itch in us. That's like, I wanna do something and I wanna work and I wanna move towards God myself. Like the how feels good because it gives us something to do. But the how only gets us so far because we can know the right things to do and anybody can change their behavior and change their patterns for a while. But at some point, when your habits are interrupted, when your rhythms are interrupted, when things get busy, it's real easy to revert back to the way that you used to do things. I don't see this any clearer than uh, with New Year's resolutions. Um, you guys know what this is like. Every December 31st, everybody goes, man, I don't feel as good as I want to. I wanna get in better shape. And we all know the how to do that. We go to the gym and we diet, we eat right. We all know the how. That's not the application for today, just for what that's worth. We know the how, and we do it. People are really good about setting those gym memberships, getting on diets, doing the things that they know they need to do. But like January 4th, like when the bed feels good, and you're like, man, I just, I'll just skip today. Like, I'll just skip today. Or like you go on vacation, and you're like, well, vacation calories don't count. Like, I can eat whatever I want. I'll start, start back when I go back. And it's never harder to go to the gym than after a day that you've skipped. <laughs> we, and the how didn't change. You still know the how. You still know to eat right and go to the gym. But at some point, the how's not enough. There's gotta be a why. You've got to remember why you wanted to change in the first place. That's what's gonna motivate you to get out of bed on January 5th. Not just knowing the right thing to do. It's knowing the why. And when it comes to us bearing the fruit of the Christian life, us living like Jesus and loving like Jesus, the how's important, but the why matters way more than the how because that's what's gonna change us. And Jesus continues to meet us here. So let's continue on. We'll go verse six. Jesus says, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. Let's pause right here for just a second. Because uh, some of us, we read that verse and we can't even move on to hear the rest of what Jesus has to say because we get scared. Um, in this verse, Jesus is not saying, Christian, you better figure out how to bear fruit or I'm casting you out. Jesus isn't saying, you're gonna get to the end of your life and if you haven't done enough, sorry. 
that's not what he's saying. Because even in this passage, it always starts identity first and then what we need to do. Jesus, in verse three of this passage to the disciples, he said, you're already clean because of the words I have spoken to you. Now go bear fruit. Now go abide in me. So we've got to start identity. So here, if you read this passage and you're a believer, don't fear. Read it and know and rejoice that God's never going to cast you out and that you will bear fruit if you're in Christ. There is no branch that is totally connected to Jesus that doesn't bear fruit. If you're a believer, you don't have a choice. You will bear fruit because the Spirit is working inside you and growing you, and that's a win. If you read this verse, though, and we're, you have not trusted in Jesus, if you have read this verse and you, you go, I know I don't believe in Jesus, then we really can't get away from what this verse is saying. Um, it's, it's hard, but I look around this room and none of us in this room, Christian or not, can climb our way to God with our own good works. It is only because of Jesus' righteousness that we are saved. And when God looks at us and sees us as righteous, it's not because of us. It is totally because of Jesus. Even when we bear fruit on the back end of the Christian life, it is only through Jesus. Your works climbing your way to God won't be enough. And I don't say that out of, out of hate. I say it out of love because I, I need the same thing you do. And it's Jesus. We need him. We need the gospel and what he did for us. So if you have never trusted in him, if you, maybe it's your first time in a church, if you don't know who Jesus is or, or why you should trust in him, I'd love to have that conversation with you after this. Uh, maybe you've been in church for a long time and I could ask you the gospel and you could tell me what it is, but you don't know if you've ever really trusted in Jesus's works for you on the cross. I'd love to have that conversation too. Let's not leave this morning not having that settled because um, it's, too, it's too important, not only to bearing fruit, uh, but to eternal life and eternal security and assurance. Um, so let's have that conversation. Jesus doesn't shy away from that tension, um, and I don't think we should either. And so let's go on. Jesus continues to meet us here. Verse seven, Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. We know the how. Here's the why. We bear fruit for our joy and for God's glory. Let's flip it. Go God's glory first because it comes first in verse 8. God is glorified when we bear fruit. It says so right here. When we live like Jesus and love like Jesus, when we do the things that we know that we're supposed to do, live into those moments that God's planned for us, God gets the glory. And God gets the glory for a couple of reasons. One, because if we do good things, if we bear fruit, it's not because of anything in us. It is purely and only because of God's spirit working in us and growing that fruit in us. So when we do good things, when we do the things we know we should, we can pat ourselves on the back, but ultimately go, that wasn't me at all. I know it was Jesus. So he gets the glory. And we rejoice not in ourselves, but in him. Second reason it's for God's glory is because from the beginning of time, we know that God has planned all things. Any moment that happens in this life, we can look to God and trust and know that he's in it. And so if there is a moment where you have an opportunity to glorify him or to glorify yourself or something else, and you choose God, that's a God-ordained, God-orchestrated, God-planned moment. And so we glorify God in that when we do good things, not only because he's doing them in us, but because he planned them from the beginning. We get to look to God and, and give him all praise and all glory because it's always been him. He's the one that bears fruit through us to point to himself. And that's a win. So God's glory is one reason. The other why is for our joy. And Jesus says this in verse 11. 
He says, these things, I, the, these things I have spoken to you that you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And this is the harder one kind of for us to grasp, I think, because we have on one hand obedience and on the other hand, joy. And obedience a lot of times can feel like a burden, not like a freedom, not like a joy. And that's because our obedience to Jesus means dying to ourself. It means giving up some things, saying no to some things that we may want to do. It means intentionally serving others over ourselves. It means denying ourselves when it comes to Christ, when it comes to other people. And that's hard. That doesn't always sit well with us. But we know, we can know this is true. One, because Jesus said it, he's our creator. But two, because we know the opposite is true. We know what it looks like to disobey Jesus and know the hurt that it brings. We know what it looks like to look at something God says to stay away from and go, I kind of feel like doing it anyway, and do it. And it makes you feeling more empty than it did before you did it. We know what it looks like to disobey Jesus and it leads to our pain and our hurt and our despair. So if that's true, the opposite's gotta be true. That when we obey Jesus, it leads to our joy. And we can trust him in that because he is our creator. He's the one that made us. And so when he says that something is for our good, we can believe it and we can lean into that thing. And when he says that something is for our, not for us, that it's bad for us, that it'll hurt us, we can trust that too. We can trust that he means what he says and that when we listen to him in that, when we live our lives patterned on that, it leads to true joy. Our joy is found in trusting in Jesus in that way and abiding with him. And for us to abide with him isn't and doesn't just happen in the kind of warm fuzzies moments of our lives where we really feel the spirit on our hearts. Um, students, it doesn't just happen at getaway in kind of those like mountaintop camp experience moments. Those aren't the only times you're abiding in Jesus. And that's not what it looks like. A lot of times abiding in Jesus just looks like the moment to moment, day to day decisions that you have to glorify him. That's what abiding in Jesus looks like. It's not just those big emotional moments that you have. It's kind of in the mundane most of the time. This kind of reminds me a lot, um, I'll say, of Valentine's Day. Uh, guys, just in the room, pull the room. Did anybody forget? Did anybody forget Valentine's Day? I don't see a hand, and that was a test, and you passed. <laughs> so good work. It reminds me of Valentine's Day because I feel like Valentine's Day is our culture's almost pause to go, hey, couples, you remember that you love each other? And like, prove that you love each other with stale chocolate and wilted flowers <laughs> on your way home from work. <laughs> Not to call anybody out or shame anybody, but... I'll be honest, like I, I've been married, Jesse and I have been married two years. I still haven't figured out Valentine's Day gifts. I, I've tried. I feel like I either go too much or not enough. And I'm, I, there's a happy middle in there somewhere that I'm not hitting that I need to find. Um, that ch an itch that chocolate and flowers would probably scratch. Anyway, uh, I remember one time in high school, I, there was a girl I was dating at the time and I saw like an eight foot tall teddy bear. And I was like, that's something a human being would want. And so I bought it and I like gave it to her and I was like, see how much I care? And she was like, what am I supposed to do with an eight foot tall teddy bear? And I was like, that's a really good point. I didn't think about that. I was trying to show that I care and even now in marriage, try to show that I care with those like Valentine's Day gifts, right? But if throughout the rest of the year, I'm not getting gifts or I'm not setting time aside for my relationship, eventually those words are gonna fall flat. That teddy bear's not gonna mean a lot <laughs> or the chocolates that aren't good. It's not gonna mean a lot. You can say, I love you all day long, but if you're not showing it with your actions, you, you might still be married. I'm still married. You might still be in a relationship, but you're probably not gonna feel very close. You're probably not gonna be very close. Telling Jesse I love her doesn't mean nearly as much as when I set aside time for us to spend time together and when I keep my word and do the things that I say I'm gonna do. When I do those things and then say I love you, She's like, oh yeah, I know. She doesn't question it because I've shown it. And I don't do those good things 
just because they're good and I feel like doing them. I do those good things and I set aside the time and I love her well because I love her, right? And our relationship with Jesus is the exact same way. We don't live into good works just to do good works or just to be better or just to grow fruit. We bear fruit because Jesus is worth it. We bear fruit because we love him, because it gives us joy. It leads to his glory. Our fruit has that at the end goal of honoring him and glorifying him. And so I'll close with this. The how to bear fruit is to abide in Jesus. And the why is for our joy and his glory. When we look to Ephesians 2.10, it says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has already planned the good works of us that each are gonna live into for the rest of our lives. That should be comforting, that we know that as we're walking, God is with us every step of the way, that he's growing those good works in us and bearing fruit in us. And when we succeed in that, God gets the glory. However, when we walk up and we have a moment where we fail, where we know the good we should do and when we don't do it, God is a grace-giving father who loves to reach out to us, to redeem us, and to pull us in close to him again. And in that, he gets the glory too. When his grace shows towards us, his heart is revealed towards us, he gets the glory. So in our successes of bearing fruit and in our failures, God is glorified. And we know that's true because Jesus is the true vine and he did what we could not do and led us to the Father. And we can trust him in that. We can abide with him because of that. Uh, I'm gonna invite the band back up, um, but this is, I'm gonna end. There's something that I do every week in student ministry and I'm gonna do it here uh, because I'm here. Um, and I like to end with a question. Um, and it's not a question that I just want you, it's not rhetorical. Um, it's not a question I just want you to think on, um, but I want you to think on it and I want you to go talk about it with the people you're with. So whether you're at lunch, on your way home in the car, wherever, how can we abide with Jesus daily this week? What is one step that you could take towards him to abide in his love? Parents, what's a way that you're gonna lead your family this week to abide with him? What's a way this week that you can point your kids directly to the love that Jesus has for them? Students in the room, how are you gonna abide with Jesus this week? How can you point your friends and your parents and your siblings towards Jesus? How can you love like Jesus and live like Jesus this week? And we can answer that question and lean into that question because we know Jesus has already done it for us. So as we try to figure out what it looks like to hold on to him and to move and live, remember that he holds on to you and that it's enough. And let's worship him to that end today.